Now, I'm Dan Wood. I'm Ravi Abbott. And we host the UK's biggest weekly retro gaming podcast. Now, our show comes out every Friday. Uh, not only do we talk about what's been happening in the world of retro over the last week, covering new stories and old releases and new releases for classic systems, but also our show every week has an interview. Now, we get on veterans from the video game industry to talk about their stories, but also we get YouTubers on regularly as well because... Today, that is where you go to get information about classic games, and I think, you know, YouTube is really the go-to place for retro gaming these days. And we are very lucky to have a great community of retro gaming YouTubers here in the UK. So, our panel today has got some of our finest choices on. Uh, we'll start from the end there, Sarah. Just uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about your channel as well. I'm, I'm all tangled up with Ashens at the moment. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff, for goodness sake. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Octavius. Um, I do a, a, a channel where I, I mostly have a mental breakdown, but um, I also cover really, really, really bad games uh, because they're the best. They're the best kind of games. Hello, I'm Stuart Ashen, aka Ashens, and my channel is bad. <laughs> By which I mean good. No, I don't. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Justice. I do documentaries about old computers, old consoles, review some incredibly weird things from time to time. It's a very British channel. It's, um, yeah, I don't really do American stuff. I don't even really know it exists. So, yeah, that, that's me pretty much. Hey there, guys. I'm DJ Slope from Slope's Game Room. Um, I'm most known for my Kick Scammer series and the Complete History series, where I look into the complete retrospective of video games. Uh, yeah. That's me. Hello, my name is Daz. I uh, am part of a channel called Did You Know Gaming, where we talk about sort of video game trivia and just little known information about series and random bits to do with the gaming industry. Hello, my name is Peter Lee. I run the channel Nostalgia Nerd, where I get disproportionately excited about hardware from about 30 years ago, which is a weird trait to have. Hello you, I am Guru Larry, uh, I've, I run the YouTube channel youtube.com slash Larry and I cover weird anecdotes from gaming history and sort of hilariously stupid drama over the years, I think. Well it would be good to... Well, I like it. Yeah, I'm going to use your mic. <laughs> so it would be good to find out kind of your earliest gaming memory from childhood, each of you. We'll start with you Larry, what, what kind of got you started in video games and computers? Uh, I've, I've got a much older brother, and he brought home a Atari VCS from WH Smiths, you know, when they used to sell games back in the day. And um, we used to play games on that, but we were so poor, we couldn't afford to buy games. We used to rent them from a local e electrical uh, TV repair shop. So that's my fame. Uh, and the earliest game I can remember playing is Combat, the two tanks. And I got accused of cheating because I was really good at it. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, my dad, dad was a programmer uh, quite early on, so in about 1985 he brought back a ZX Spectrum and loaded up a game called Jetpack and I was just captivated by controlling this little guy on the screen. I couldn't play it because I was probably a bit too young to do it, but just, just seeing these visuals moving about and being in control of them kind of engaged me and from that point onwards I was just drawn in for life. Um, I don't really remember because I've had video games since I was basically born. I have uh, three older brothers, so I couldn't help but get into video games. Um, I think one of my earliest I really think of is playing the Amiga and a game called Degeneration, but I don't know if that was my first game. I have no idea. It's been too long. Yeah, I'm the same. It's hard to know exactly what your first game was, but my earliest gaming memories were on the Amstrad CPC 464, which came in just after I was born. The two games, one of the two games was Oh Mummy, uh, which is a maze game um, where you had to run away from mummies. And uh, the other one was Bridget. And if anyone's played Bridget, where well, you have to, <laughs> you remember Bridget? You had to start from the top and get to the bottom, but close the bridges and it was absolutely impossible, especially for like a three or four year old, however old I was at the time. So my dad used to work for Amstrad and um, one day, I think it was like about 1989, uh, he bought a ZX Spectrum home and um, that was basically it from then. Um, I just go into all like, the magazines, um, played a lot of the old games on the cover tapes and all of that. I can't really remember what my first game was. Um, it was probably something like a the all-time classic uh, Monte Carlo Casino by Codemasters. Anyone know that game? 
<laughs> I think I think I saw one hand. So at least uh, that was one more than I expected. I think I saw a tumbleweed. <laughs> yeah, probably that too. <laughs> Uh, my older sister says uh, in the late 70s in sort of pubs and open areas when I saw a Pac-Man machine or something I would become sort of obsessed with it. Nobody had put any coins in it of course because I was too young but uh, I think my first proper games I would have played would have been on one of her friend's Atari VCS. Couldn't tell you what it was, hopefully not E.T. But um, yeah, I think I was always obsessed with you know, here's television, but on this thing, you can make the things on the screen move yourself. <sighs> Which is now why I make films. <coughs> uh, <laughs> this is not awkward at all. Hello, Stuart. Um, I, my first um, gaming memory would absolutely be when I was about five years old, my half-brother had a blatant rip-off of a Pac-Man handheld called Puck-Man. Um, it looked exactly like Pac-Man, played exactly like it. Um, it used to take about 200,000 D batteries and ran out in about 30 minutes, but I was obsessed with it. So that was my first experience of gaming. And after that, moved on to a little bit of the uh, Master System, bit of Alex Kidd. Get right in there with the classics. Yeah. Well, Stuart, we all know you've played some uh, pretty old books recently. Have you kind of found any new terrible games you've seen? Frequently. Uh, Bridget is on there, you'll be pleased to hear, Daniel. Yeah. That was, it was a tie-up between that and Roland on the Run for the last book, but Roland on the Run just pipped it by annoying me slightly more. I'm annoyed, actually. I played that for the first time since I was a kid. And I always remember Bridget being a really good game because I was only three or four oh, when okay, I played that's it. that's the only excuse. Yeah. I'll let you off. Is, that, when I, is that the train one? No, no, Bridget was... No, 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 the, uh, Roland on the Run. Yeah, Roland the on the Run oh, is the right. train one. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a reverse Frogger, wasn't it, almost? Yeah, kind of, but it makes no sense. It's I, almost I just, impossible. I never worked out how to play that game. I and I did a can. Roland video, I still <laughs> couldn't work out how to play it. <laughs> I mean, it's the worst of the Roland games, and that's really saying something. Roland being Amstrad's mascot, and they didn't understand the concept of a mascot, so he's different in every game. And I don't mean he just looks different. Like, in one game, he's a flea. In the next game, he's a robot. In the next one, he's a man in a hat. Yeah. He's a giant yeah. cube as well in one, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a cube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think they got loads of different programmers to make them, didn't they, at the same time? And they, they just chucked them together and they were like, yeah, Roland for everything. Exactly, yeah. What, what's up with the flea? No, no, just call him Roland. Like, literally, that was what they <laughs> How did. sure was that meeting? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we want you to make a, a, a game based on our mascot, Roland. Okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs> what does he look like? <laughs> Don't know. Don't care. Bye. It it's very, it's very typical Amstrad, really, isn't it? Just throw stuff together like they're all in one hi fis and all that, like hi fi stroke VCR. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But my most recent discovery was one that somehow eluded me for years called, I think it's Graham Saunas' Vector Soccer. Oh, God. And it's for the Amiga, and it runs. Well, I mean, it's so ugly, it's unbelievable. You've just got, like, a sphere and some triangles, and that's your players. And it runs at, like, three frames a second or something. It is quite possibly the worst football game ever. Now, that's quite an achievement as well. That, it's that or, like, World Cup Carnival. Yeah. So that's my tip for the bottom for this week. <laughs> well, Larry, I know that you got oh. a, a Mega Drive when it was very new, didn't you? Yeah, so I got, I got from a sort of import from... Japan. What did you love about that system then? What memories have you got? Well, the first games I bought from were eSWAT and New Zealand Story, which I spent years trying to tell everyone it, it did come out on the Mega Drive because it never come out over here. But um, yeah, and I just love the Mega Drive. Sort of great, great memories of it. So, and did you have 32X and Mega? Oh CD yeah, and all I'm of so spoiled. I was so yeah. So yeah, no, it's great. I really like the 32X. I don't know why it gets. I think it's all these angry reviewers on the internet get an unfair bashing. I mean, the only downside it was it didn't have many games because they cancelled it too early. Um, if they if they carried on, basically, if they brought it out two years before, it would have been a great system. And it had games like Daytona that was being developed for it and stuff like that. It's got an awesome space Harrier. Space Calibre Harrier. Space Harrier. Well, I don't like that. I, don't, well, I want an Outrun. Why didn't that come out for it? The only one people actually care about that didn't come out. No. It would have been nice if they finished Virtual Hamster as well. Virtual yeah. Hamster. That was for the 32X, wasn't it? It was. Basically, it was the... You know the uh, uh, Bart's Nightmare, where he's going down the, uh, the water slide? It's basically that and as, as a whole game. But you're a hamster. Yeah, but you're a hamster instead of Homer Simpson. So... Well, What's gaming television was massive then as well. I know you were actually on a, a show with Violet Berlin, Head to Head. Yes. Does anyone remember Head to Head? 
Oh, well, it's five billion. Hand up, hand up, hand That one person again. Yeah. <laughs> what was that experience like then, going on that show? Uh, well, it was um, it was weird. It was it was filmed in a, an abandoned mansion in uh, St John's Wood, and they just got rid of the sets. Uh, they just previously filmed a series of a Super Mario game show where people, uh, two kids play like speed running levels and getting the most coins and stuff like that. So, but um, it was weird. Um, you sat in front of a giant brain. You sat in front of a, like a seven-inch screen so you could hardly see, especially when you're playing like split-screen Mario Kart. <laughs> and I was my, you know, I was 14. I had much better eyesight back then. But yeah, it was, it was quite weird. And I used to run, win weird prizes like Yahtzee, because every child likes Yahtzee. Well, I was wondering, um, kind of, just to the general panel, which one do you prefer then, Saturn or 32X? I thought that would be a good thing. I think the 32X is massively underrated. It could have been so much more oh, brother, than it was. Brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> I mean, the Saturn was good, you know, it was a good rival to the PlayStation that came along. But the 32X, it, it, it was misplaced, true, but if they put a bit more marketing in it, a bit more money, a bit more time, it could have made some really good games for that platform. I think and two years the, earlier. That's one of the things about the 32X is that the reason it's so bashed by everybody on the internet is because people bought it when it was new and it had nothing. And then it continued to have nothing and so people really did just waste money on it in a way. And with the Saturn, there was always just nothing on it and it never got cheaper and it was just kind of a, a waste of time at Sega's part, I think. And uh, you couldn't borrow it for years either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't, can't even emulate it very well nowadays. No, no. So the Dreamcast, that was when Sega brought it all back. Uh, the 32X and the Saturn really kind of took Sega down a notch after the Mega Drive. It also, um, the Saturn, it doesn't use polygons, does it? It uses square... Oh, quad, quadrangles. Quadrangles, yes, it, yeah. Quadrangles. So it's like really hard to port Saturn games to any other system because everyone else uses polygons and everyone else, and they just use a square one. Well, you, you it did get... awesome 2D, though. Yeah, it's good. Well, that's all right, yeah. 2D and that was... You, you could get a, a plug-in card for the uh, PC, which used the Saturn graphics, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you could actually Titan or something, wasn't it called? Yeah. Something, yeah. Uh, can't well, the thing is that the Saturn actually uses a modified yeah, GeForce graphics card from mm, NVIDIA. Yes. Ridiculously yeah, expensive now if you want to buy one. I mean, you're spending like well over a grand now if you want to get one. Yeah. So it's just cheap to get a Saturn, like 40 quid. So. What's interesting though is the Saturn actually has a few games which are on other consoles that are ports, and they're actually better versions, which I find really bizarre. Like Resident Evil 2 is actually better on the Saturn than it yeah. was on... Uh, Resident Evil 1, sorry was better on the Saturn than it was on the, uh, the PlayStation. Mm. And, and uh, all the uh, Capcom fighting games. Yeah, and, Cal and Castlevania Symphony yeah. at Night, which is the best game ever made. Never come out over here, though. It was annoying. No, it was Nocturne of the Moonlight. <laughs> it was only released in Japan, which is a real shame. Wasn't the 32X launch the one where Sega said, here's our new 32X, but we're bringing the Saturn out soon, and yeah. totally crippled themselves? Yeah, they did it straight after. It's such a shame. If they carried on with the 32X for a little bit longer, they would have realised that the world wanted, at the time, um, more 3D games, and they would have maybe changed the, the, way, the way Saturn was uh, put out, I think, if they stayed a little bit longer with the 32X. But retrospectively, I think the Saturn is... Well, the, the, the best was console of that Saturn generation. Saturn was designed to be a 2D machine. A yeah, it is the but, ultimate yeah, 2D the 3D, machine. 3D stuff was only like an afterthought. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they forced that on there because, I mean, yeah. they had to because that's what the world wanted. But yeah. uh, I thought it was a gimmick. Some of the best yeah, yeah. 2D games were on the Saturn. You yeah. know, like, really unheard. I mean, like, even things like Shinobi X, one of the ones that no one really talks about in the Shinobi series. That's an incredible game. Mm. Um, shooting up in value as well. Actually, bought, you bought it, didn't you? From yeah. From electro shop down the road from me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah, the 32X came out at pretty much exactly the same time as the Saturn in Japan. So, um, and Japan really didn't want to push it because it was kind of seen as an American project after a while. So, uh, Sega were almost kind of competing against themselves, different divisions. Oh, they hated uh, each other too, didn't they? Yeah, 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 and, yeah, and um, Japan won in the end. <coughs> yeah. Base, I mean, because the Saturn did really well in Japan. Like, it actually beat um, the Nintendo 64. It was second in that generation. So they basically got all that success in Japan while screwing over America and Europe. At the same time, I think that was just part of like the political war in the company at that yeah, time. Yeah, sadly, we wanted those 3D games, no matter how crap they were. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to classic gaming television, I know Games Master always gets a lot of love, but from watching your channel, Peter, it wasn't your favourite show, was it? 
Well, I, I mean, look in here. I mean, this is the perfect set for Games Master, isn't it? I mean, you could have like Dominic Diamond back there. It would be amazing. Yeah. But um, Patrick Moore. Patrick, he could, you couldn't have Patrick Moore, could you? Obviously. I don't know. Bring, a, bring his own along or something. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a very different type put of show. Put a monocle on an urn. There you go. It's the same thing. It's just to, to shake it just, around to be sarcastic every just, five just seconds. Bad taste. That's what you can do. With special effects these days. Just you know, get some old footage. Just have his mouth move. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I went for an audition for Games Master when it first started, and uh, Patrick Moore wasn't even intended to be the original presenter. They actually wanted a baby, like uh, you know, the, you know, like um, Teletubbies had the baby. They wanted a baby that spoke. <laughs> yeah, no. And also, they were thinking about uh, Heinz Wolf at one point as well, because he would have been a good alternate, wouldn't he? I'm um, <laughs> oh, sorry. But, <laughs> but what you were saying, yeah, is, my, yeah, my favourite show was Bad Influence, obviously, because that, that's good old Andy Crane. Good old Andy Crane, yeah, got no brain. brain. Yeah, because it was a proper sort of uh, news show. Uh, every time we had no, well, we had Digitizer, obviously, which we were talking about yesterday. But other than that, it was a weekly update of things which were really exciting because the 90s were an incredibly exciting time for new technology. I mean, virtual reality came out, and we thought that's amazing. It turned out to be utter shite, but <laughs> at the time, it was really exciting. And also, do you remember when they had the PlayStation on there? Like they had the first PlayStation in the country. Oh, that's right. the episode was, I remember the most. Yeah. I remember that, yeah. It was yeah. like a spotlight on it, wasn't yeah. it? And he whipped back the, the veil. He was like, whoa, look at this machine. But it was so exciting because yeah. we didn't have the internet to build up our excitement. Yeah. So it's, what we got was like three month old magazines yeah. and. And what were they called? The super consoles at that time. Yeah, yeah. Was nickname, oh, yeah they it? used to go down the line, didn't they? They were like, here's the uh, 3DO, here's the Jaguar, that's old hat now. Here's <laughs> the PlayStation. It's been out least three months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah. remember when uh, Bad Influence, they um, had the, um, what's something called the Mega PC on. And it was, um, it was a PC, it was an Amstrad product. Wasn't it? Um, it was a PC, but it was also a Mega Drive. So it had like, a slot that... You know, it was like, oh, you can do your word processing and all that, do all your homework, and then after that, you can play Sonic. And, like, to an eight-year-old or whatever, that just seemed like the most incredible thing. Yeah, eight-year-olds absolutely love spreadsheets, don't they? So. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's, it's, it's two things in one, though. It now I can convince the parents. Exactly. It would have been amazing if you played Sonic in a window within Windows, but you had to literally <laughs> slap the entire PC off. So all your spreadsheets mm. and stuff, just slide them aside, put the Mega Drive in, and it was just, it, you might as well just have a separate console with a separate TV on the side. But yeah, that, that was, I think, the reason why it failed. Well, yeah. they had the Terra Drive in Japan, which let you do that, put yeah. it in Windows. Yeah, and but don't forget the Sega PC range that they had as well. <laughs> What? No, we don't. Sega PC range. <laughs> no, no, sorry, we don't. You make the Sega. Stop you, you, you could play Daniel. You could play like Comic Zone and Sonic Free and Knuckles. Oh, and a few what? others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Sonic PC oh, range. Yeah, yeah. For the PC, right? Yeah, started off with oh, um, oh, that's the their thing, version of Sega. They were enhanced. Well. a graphics card was Saturn one, wasn't it? Like you could get Sega Rally for it, and it was enhanced if you had the Saturn oh, graphics card. I'll say yeah. yes. Yeah, just just <laughs> not, just not. Yeah. The other cool bad influence thing was whenever they talked about um, piracy or modern consoles, like they tell you everything about how to do it. They'd go into like Xcopy, like the famous program for copying all your Amiga discs, and then just at the end, like Andy would go, "But be careful! If you do this, it might blow up your system." <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, they were probably heavily against illegal activities, weren't they? They would scare kids to death from copying but they, discs. But they told you everything about how to do yeah, it. Yeah, at yeah, the same yeah, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But she, she did smash it with a hammer about after three attempts. You remember that? Just, what by that? Yeah, she used to smash up her pirate copy she made. I, I must have blocked it out. Oh, okay. Blurred my <laughs> like, no, yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think about modern gaming TV? Because we had the recent Rob Beckett show and there was also Go 8 Bit. Do you think there should be more stuff there? I think um, the world has moved on a little bit, and the fact they just use stand up comedians in it as well. I wish they used some people from the internet. Even if, like, something we don't like, so... <laughs> but, yeah, I think uh, it'd be good if Dave picked up Digitizer for show, because apparently that's a really good show, which is coming out soon. <laughs> plug, plug. <laughs> Let's talk about the arcades, because obviously that was where we all went back in our younger days. I know, Kim, you were an avid arcade goer. What, what was so special about the arcades when you were growing up? Um, well, I grew up and born and raised in uh, Southend-on-Sea, and Southend-on-Sea obviously got all the famous for having the longest pleasure period in the world. Had loads of arcades um, I think I first dragged my parents there when I was like seven years old and literally just every week like come on come to the arcades and it was like the glorious time you had like Simpsons, Street Fighter 2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Sunset Riders so many amazing games 
and eventually like, my parents just said to me, right, they're actually closed for the winter, so you know, we can't go there anymore. And then a month later, my dad accidentally took me down the seafront again, just drove me down there and was like, hang on, they're not closed at all. Lies. Lie. You lied to me. <laughs> but, but yes, I mean, the whole of the 90s, just the arcade scene there, and it's, um, it's a shame to see what it is now because generally most arcades, I mean, they have nothing like the machines that are out there. It's all kind of really bad modern things, like, you know, you get ticket dispensers, you know, you get your takes on Angry Birds or whatever, and it's... Oh, you, you turn yourself off, mate. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but have you seen the Jesus Christ? Have you seen the incredible prizes on offering the arcades where you can get like teapots and like oh. little birds made of slinkies? Slinkies. Yeah, slinkies. It's amazing. Holy s. Hello. I got a Batman fidget spinner once. That was uh, the best prize I think I've ever got out of an arcade. Because I it actually did something. <laughs> no, the best, because um, I, I used to live, I live in London and that, so going to the seaside to arcades was like the highlight of my year. And uh, to me back then, going to the arcades is like the cinema of video games. That you saw these brand new games coming out and you knew they were coming out to your system like six months to a year's time. So it's always exciting to play them in their sort of best vision. In, yeah, so Back in the early 90s, I mean, the games that were in the arcades were a lot more advanced than the games you could get at home, mostly. It wasn't until PlayStation came on when you actually got games that were pretty much arcade perfect. They were used the same hardware to make them, and that was kind of one of the contributing factors to the arcades falling by the wayside. Because now, I mean, games in the arcade are, they're basically equal or mostly inferior to the games you get at home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I noticed recently when I went to um, an arcade, I was playing around with those 2P machines, and I saw a couple of £5 pound spender, notes eh? really, really close, and I was like, I'm going to get these £5 notes, and then I realised what they've all done now, down in Hastings, near where I live, they've actually, they're not real £5 notes, they've, they, instead of, you know, the Queen's face is a, like a Fortnite character printed on there, or something like that, and I'm like, they're all fake, and I'm like, well, what am I going to do with this? I've just spent a tenner trying to get these. Like, <laughs> The ones in Great Yarmouth at the penny machines that would bring them forward were actually sellotaped onto the uh, end. And of course, all the coins mean you can't see them. Until it gets to that certain point, you're like, you swines, you lied to me and now I believe in nothing. I think one thing with arcades, like the reason those coin pushes are fun is because it's the only place where you can really play that. You know, like you can play Pac-Man at home now. So it's, what's the point in going to the arcade and paying money? But like, things like Sega point. Rally, right? You can't play that at home in the same way, or Dance Dance Revolution, or whatever else. Those are the main draws for an arcade nowadays. Which are gimmicky stuff, you mean? <laughs> yeah, stuff well, stuff yeah, you can't emulate at home, like, like steering it, wheels. And it's not bad that it's gimmicky. Like yeah. There's a lot of really good games, like Bishy Bashy Special, which is amazing, but you can only really get the same experience by having a machine dedicated to it, which is kind of a shame that we don't really have that very much anymore. Well, it's just too much space. I mean, look at all the fat of like, Guitar Hero. Everybody had tons of plastic guitars, and they're worthless now. You just stick them in on top of the wardrobe or something for the rest of eternity, don't you? So. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, um, I remember on the ZX Spectrum, I had a, a jackpot machine. And I, I, I laid it up, and I was sitting there rolling the reels, and after 10 minutes, I was like, what the hell am I doing with my life? I'm not trying to win money here. It's just that arcade experience does not translate at all, does it? I mean, it's a good attempt, but just pointless. I remember, like, uh, my, my parents were a little bit unsure about hearing about this new Mortal Kombat game coming out. And, you know, we weren't allowed to get the bus on our own at that sort of age and that sort of thing. But me and my friend did sneak all our way to Hastings just to, oh, there it is, the Mortal Kombat machine. It was, that was the experience we had. Again. I, I saw it in, like, a random Sega Mean Machines magazine or something like that. And I went all the way to Hastings just to go and find a Mortal Kombat machine. And it blew my mind. You just don't get that anymore. Well, Daniel, you cover kind of failed Kickstarters, <laughs> yeah. so are we going to be seeing any uh, Spectrum-based ones at the moment? <laughs> Aha, yes, yes. <laughs> I might have someone helping me work on a pretty in-depth story. Uh, yeah, I can't say too much just yet, but uh, yeah, I've got some good inside stuff on that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, which ones that you have covered are like the most outrageous ones? Have you got one that sticks in your mind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, you as the voice, Ashins. Yes, I remember. <laughs> 
So I did a Kickstarter uh, video based on the uh, on, on this guy that was a, a movie extra. He was in like The Walking Dead. He was done quite well for himself. He was in like Fast and Furious movies. Um, yeah, pretty big budget movies. Um, and uh, basically, he had like six different Kickstarter campaigns. He was quite a bit of a board game geek as well. And basically, every time he did one, he'd really he'd start running out of money, and then he'd start another one to hopefully pay a little bit more for the recent one, and then do another one. It kept going on six times, and he never delivered on any of it. So I did this hardcore video, uh, really, really slamming the guy. I think, what, what did I call the video? Six, um, the, kick scammer, the, the Kickstarter scum that run away with your money six times. It was pretty hardcore, but he, almost <laughs> half a million pound or something like that that he took away. Um, and I, as, I, as my wife was helping me make it, because there was just so much in there, I got her to help me write the script. I remember looking over and just saying, I wonder if this guy will ever see this video, and then a few hours after it went live, he became a Patreon to me, and I was like, whoa, and I didn't know whether I should feel scared. Tell him how much he donated as well, so he had a big spender. Oh, he's only like a dollar. Yeah. But I was just like, <laughs> is, it a, is it a fake, but as a Patreon, uh, 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 the, the owner of a Patreon, you can see their, in the, their email address, and it was his actual website. And I was like, I don't know what I should do. Uh, I don't care, he's giving me a pound, whatever. But I ended up giving him a refund. And what he tried to do was take down the video via Patreon. I'm like, well, you're not going to do that. Because you, you know, you're not going to, yeah, it, it got really bad. And he tried to send a DMCA to my Patreon to take it all down and all that stuff. I said I'll remove the post, but my Patreons know who I am. I don't really care. Yeah, it was a, a scary moment for me. <laughs> You just have to wait 500,000 months and then you've taken the money back. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, it dawned on me that I probably shouldn't be taking money from someone that I'm, I'm, I'm damning for stealing. <laughs> yeah, so I gave him a refund and just blocked him. <laughs> I think a lot of people that grew up in Britain will have memories of using uh, acorn machines at school, like Granny's Garden on the BBC Micro. Yes. Uh, you covered that quite a lot, Peter, and your channel, Acorn. Were they, were they a fond memory of yours? Well, we're just, they're just uh, so, we're not, we're not covered enough, are they? We're just seen so much as educational machines, but um, they need more credit than they deserve, because they were such powerful machines, and uh, they had good games on them, like Elite came out on the BBC Micro, and that's an amazing game from uh, the era it came out in. What's the port like compared to the Spectrum one? The Spectrum, the Spectrum port is pretty good. What's the, big, what's the BBC port like compared to the Spectrum? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger game. There's more stuff. There's, there's a larger area to explore. The graphics are better. There's, there's more sort of uh, things you can do to progress and build your ship up. It's just, it's just a, a better game. And um, uh, they were always in school. So they, we always had BBC Micros and Acorns in my school. And, and the thing that first caught my eye was the uh, logo machine and the, uh, the turtle they used to have. So you could get the logo programming language and you could do it on screen and tell the computer where to draw a picture but we had a turtle with a pen in the sport tour and you could draw a picture on the screen and then this turtle would fly off across the sport tour and do it on this massive sheet of paper and I was like my god this is incredible so um, <laughs> yeah, we can get turtles everywhere drawing massive pictures and um, it just it's, that was another moment for me which kind of captured me and then dragged me into this world Eventually we just got printers. Yeah. I think they're a little bit better and more efficient. <laughs> it took us three years to write a letter, didn't it? <laughs> Hello! Well, Sarah, you cover um, kind of obscure systems in your channel as well. So I've seen a recent video on the Casio Loopy. Um, why did that interest you? Um, well, to be honest, it interested me because it was made exclusively for women and obviously being um, a woman, <laughs> I just thought it was quite funny. Um, I, uh, um, being female does kind of um, cause some issues online, I have to say, unfortunately. Um, I don't really consider myself to be male or female, I just kind of, you know, do whatever, but the character Octavius is ostentatiously female, um, so I thought it would be good to cover a system which was supposed to be uh, marketed towards um, women, and I, I just found it hilarious. The idea of a load of guys, it must have been blokes, in, in a room going, you know what, you know what girls like? Fucking stickers. They go mad for stickers, mate. Let's just do a console. Just fucking stickers everywhere. They'll be so happy and so excited. Um, and I, I, if it had been marketed as a sticker maker, fine. You know, we all love a bit of stickers. I mean, we all agree we love a bit of stickers. Stick them everywhere. Just annoy well, everyone. Those are those Mega those Drive stickers, sticker booth yeah, are, yeah. Those sticker booth arcade machines in Japan. Yeah, like, yeah, they're yeah. They're not the biggest Fantastic. selling thing of all time, mate. Absolutely. But one of those if, at Sega World, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
pretty awesome, but if you actually con if you actually say, oh, this is actually a console with games that girls will like, and it's literally, I mean, one of them is literally a sticker book that you that you print out, and then you go, look, I've got a sticker book about there's like it's a romance between a teacher and a, a pupil, so it's a bit weird, but it's also like, well. Okay, I've got that good. Now what? What am I doing with my life? I'm really sad and alone in my room by myself it's, with it's, no friends. It's like the, the small feminine brain can only handle this, yeah, this exactly. activity. Let's create this for them. It would be amazing. I love it's that. Like... And it's, it's irritating because there was, um, oh, what was it called? Um, there was a, a super cassette lady vision, which was a, a female version of the, uh, the super cassette vision. And it's, it's pink. And it comes in a little pink briefcase. And it's fucking awesome. Like, imagine walking around with that being like, yay, I'm female and I've got a super cassette vision. That kind of thing's kind of cool, I think, like having different colours for different consoles, but having an actual console that's like, no, this is for girls only, and it is the stickers, and you will like the stickers. Yeah. yeah. It's I, I just, I'm sorry, I just find that hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I also did a review of the Loopy. Did you have the game where the entire plot revolves around you going to a fashion school and avoiding your creepy uncle? <laughs> like, like that's the plot of the game. And I thought the Japanese translator I had was messing with me and she's like, no, you have never been to Japan. You do not understand that creepy uncle hassling you while you're at school is a perfectly viable narrative for a video game. So, so that's one to look out for. I did actually play that one. That's the one I enjoyed most, actually. <laughs> because there is actually a certain level of gameplay to it. It's like, I've got to avoid this bloody creepy uncle, fuck's sake. It's just, it's really funny. I, I also, I especially enjoyed that that was the first video that I had where people started telling me that I was copying you. There was a, a lot of comments that were like, oh, this is clearly... Oh, well, that's a right of passage if you get accused of ripping off Ashens. Yeah, yeah, or, this, or the this ABGN. is how I know yeah. that I'm starting out. I'm really getting in there now. <laughs> I mean, the problem is we look so similar. <laughs> <laughs> or you get confused for Guru Larry. Which... Oh, yeah, well, everybody confused me. Just, <laughs> just being a fat bloke on the internet, everybody thinks I'm me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Stuart, you always cover quite naff stuff on your channel. You've been nicknamed the King of Tat. Why, thank you. <laughs> I, I feel warm inside, like I'm about to vomit. King Tat. <laughs> King Tat. It's the worst of all Batman villains. <laughs> I mean, does Tat always appeal to you? Because I know you do, like, Pound World series and... Well, oh, yeah, I, got do like to see... Maybe. <laughs> I do like to see the very worst available in any consumer section, whether it be video games, toys safety things for babies. No, I haven't actually got into that yet. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I have an obsession with how badly things can go wrong when they just want to throw something out for money. And, yeah, video games and consoles and things like that are the most extreme examples, I think. Because if you can't play it and have fun, what is the point of it? Well, it does. I know that you um, do video game quizzes as well, because your tri tri uh, channel is very trivia-based. Stuff with Ashens. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, well, we've only really done one quiz so far. Uh, that was at the <laughs> Norwich Gaming Festival. But it was, it was pretty good. Um, generally speaking, it's just ask questions that people won't know the answers to, and uh, then you, you get a lot of complaints, and it's great. Have you seen a renewed interest? In, sorry, uh, sorry. Have you seen a renewed interest in kind of retro gaming quizzes? Because everywhere oh, yeah, I walk, I've sure. seen pubs. Yeah. So, like in Norwich, there's a, a gaming cafe that we often attend, and they do sort of a gaming quiz every month. And we realise people love gaming quizzes, so we're thinking maybe doing more at sort of events and stuff, which could be good. Uh, with Pete and Stuart here, uh, we've, we're now moving into a new office together, which will be very, very good. So we can arrange for events and whatnot under the, the, new, the new company name of Quick Time Events, because we're very clever. <laughs> well, Daniel, I know you're a big Sega fan, and yes. you and Kim have actually been working with Sega recently. So what, what's that been like? What have you been doing? Oh, well, I mean, primarily, obviously, with me being heavily Mega Drive based, my channel, uh, they got hold of me. Well, they got hold of me a long time ago and said, um, uh, "Do you know what an NDA is?" Do you, uh, and I was, "Yeah, I do." You know that sort of thing. <laughs> um, there's something coming up, and then they just went quiet for about three or four months. And then when they finally came back, they said, uh, "Yep, time to sign it." And then they brought us in to play some of those Mega Drive games on the PlayStation 4. Yeah, I've done a few things. Um, yeah, we played some of the Mega Drive games, um, and also because um, Sega are um, publishing Two Point Hospital which is coming out pretty soon and they kind of had me down there to like look behind the scenes, do like previews of it, which has been quite cool. Um, Se Sega actually also asked me to do it, but then I reviewed their Sega Mega Drive collection and then they stopped speaking to me after that, so <laughs> it, it's gone rapidly downhill. 
<laughs> Sega well, wouldn't speak to me in the first place, so at least you had one notch up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they just put a restraining order on me, because I keep asking for copies of Alex Kidd when the new one's coming out. So they actually contacted us as well, but uh, we've, we've had a video ready for about two and a half months, and they've just gone, yeah, well, eventually we'll say yes. So we're just sitting on this Sega video, eventually you guys might see it, you well, never know. To the whole panel, do you guys think that Sega are kind of back on track with stuff like yeah, Sonic the Mania? Right step. They're, they're, they're taking the, the right first Sonic step. Sonic Mania is a big yeah, step Sonic in the right Mania direction. Is, uh, For me, personally, being Sonic 3 and Knuckles on the Mega Drive is my all-time favourite game. Um, and this is close to better than that for me, so it's, it's, it's incredible. They're, they're really definitely on their way. Uh, I'd like to see them take a little bit more on the uh, the modders community and definitely bring back a new Streets of Rage. <laughs> definitely. I mean, I think, yeah, they need to follow the example of Sonic Mania, which was obviously designed by a guy called uh, Christian Whitehead, who started out as a modder, as a huge fan, made um, his own port of Sonic CD, which Sega eventually took on and released officially. So, yeah, I think they need to do more of that for games like Streets of Rage. Maybe even Eternal Champions or something, who knows? Oh no, that doesn't exist. It's only Virtua Fighter for them. Yeah, that's true. The thing that's great about Sonic Mania is that it's actually, uh, so I run a, another community besides the YouTube thing called the Sprites Resource, where it's all about learning how to do pixel art and sprites and stuff. And a lot of the people who worked on Sonic Mania actually established themselves in the forum. Uh, and it's really interesting seeing that Sega are actually getting involved in this kind of modding community and the smaller artists and everything else who really were doing it as passion and now they can just do it as a job. It's fantastic. It's kind of like uh, the opposite of Nintendo's strategy, isn't it? I mean, Nintendo have always kind of kept things well under wraps and anything you do is a copyright strike. Whereas, uh, it's, it, yeah, I think, I think Sega are definitely on the right track with reaching out to people who know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is with Sega is, is I don't think we're ever going to have the Sega that we used to have, but I think that's because the games are primarily arcade games. If you buy a game nowadays for, say, 40 quid that's an arcade game that you're going to quickly pick up and put down, you feel ripped off, but that is what you did back in the day. So I feel like they have the, uh, a strong back catalogue to be able to become basically the best sort of indie game, cheap sort of download, 10, yeah. 15 pound developers out there. They've got so much at their disposal. Um, there was talks at one point of a new Golden Axe game. We're talking a good five or six years ago. It was in development. There was actually footage online. Um, but one of the developers said that there were going to be parts of a Golden Axe game where you're going to see references to Outrun. There's going to be, you know, they were throwing so it all in there. shared universe. Yeah, yeah. The most ambitious sort of uni <laughs> Gordon Pan's just st steaming down the road in the <laughs> Ferrari 3. I don't know. I have literally no idea how it would have worked. But uh, yeah, apparently it was in uh, development. There's also a uh, Golden Axe TV show slash movie that's been... Uh, greenlit for the longest time. Like it's probably never going to happen. There's a new House of the Dead game that's just come out as well. It was a crazy game. taxi movie as well, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, that was. Um, in, in, I think uh, it was only in the works. But yeah, let's yeah. go make some crazy money. <laughs> <laughs> See, Crazy Taxi is the perfect example. In that game, is over in three minutes. You know, well, you do the, the same thing I mean, over and over and over. For a mobile game, because you don't. Yeah, have, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then they've not done it properly on mobile. They keep doing all of the, the 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 weird like pay to win. Mold, mold, yeah. you know, like swipe it left to move left and all that sort of yeah. thing. Like, you want a proper crazy taxi game. All I'm going to say is bring back Story of Thor. No one's played it. It was a Mega Drive game. It was absolutely incredible. And they'll never make a new one. They've got so many IPs that people just what completely is, forget about, like Soleil. Well, there's a sequel to Saturn, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, there was yeah. Story of Thor 2. Yeah. Well, it's I mean, a prequel, it was, isn't it? It's a prequel. Uh, is it? It's called 2, but it's a prequel. Yeah. yeah. But it, that was a, actually a pretty good game, although no one bought it, obviously, because it was on the Saturn. So. <laughs> also, new single player fantasy star, please. None of this online gubbins. <laughs> well, here's a question for everybody. Ooh. Why did you start your YouTube channel, and what was the video that really made you take off? We'll start with you, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. Keep on your toes. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, I don't really start on a depressing note, um, but I started my channel because I had a massive mental breakdown. Um, I, I was um, head of um, SEO for uh, Royal Mail and um, an insurance company, and it just got a little bit too much. I ended up under a table screaming, told my boss to fuck off. Um, just had a massive mental breakdown, and basically I needed to have something to do at home so I wouldn't go completely mental, and I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll start a YouTube channel because that's what mental people do. Um, well, for me. <laughs> all, all of you lot are mental, let's be honest. Okay, we're all weird here, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it started, and then I think I realised that I was actually starting to get attention that I never thought I would get when I um, 
did. Which video? Well, I think it was my soft porn adventure video, which I really put. Uh, no, no. I heard the chuckle over there, guys. No, it's, it's not that kind of channel. Um, although some people seem to think it is. It's not. A cat woman. The amount of effort that actually. video must have taken. It took There's forever, but fully acted out, almost yeah. movie-esque thing. It's so impressive. I did every single character. I had a green screen in in a tiny corner of the shittest flat you have ever seen in Ilford. It was when I just started to go back into contract work, and I was in a bad place. And the the flat I was living in, it, you had to go through an actual fly tipping area to get to it. You had to crawl over mattresses and stuff and there was some very illicit things happening in the doorway usually. Um, and yeah, I, I think doing that video really made me realise that I had a character that people liked and even though I only had like 800 subscribers at the time, there was such a good feedback on that that I thought, oh actually, maybe this is a, a good thing for me to do and maybe people really like it. And also, acting like a dick on camera is a lot of fun. People were like, yes, here's someone who will review the Cassio, Cassio Loopy at last. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've all been waiting for this. What about you, Stuart? There you go. Um, I kind of did it by accident. Um, many years ago on a forum, remember those, for um, an old video games journalist, somebody spotted this pop station ripoff of the Sony PSP when the PSP was the hottest thing in the world, literally because the batteries were a bit doffy in them. Um, and yeah, I thought I'm going to buy that as it's a fiver and I'll just improvise a thing showing it off on the sofa because it doesn't matter what the background is because like 15 people in the world will ever see it on this forum. One of them forwarded it onto B the uh, big old creative online newsletter. I was going to say used to go out on a Friday, but they've uh, restarted redoing it recently. Um, yeah, and it got like 70,000 downloads, because it was in the days before any sort of video sharing site, so you had to download the WMV file from sendfiles.net or whatever, but yeah, 70,000 was insane in those days, and I was like, oh. And of course I hadn't put, I'd made it, I hadn't put my website or anything like that, because I didn't think anyone would see it, so therefore a million Americans American teenagers were pretending they had made it. I thought, right, I shall do a second one to prove I did the first and still forgot to put my website address on because <laughs> quality. Um, yeah, and that got even more uh, views. And I was like, oh, well, this is odd. I'm going to do a third one and that will be it because people will be sick of it then. It, they were not sick of it. Um, more people watched that. Then the video sharing sites came out, so I backed uh, Google Video because I always back the winner. And when that went bust 14 seconds later, because YouTube was purchased by Google, I went over to YouTube in February 2006. My God, that seems a long time ago now. Probably because it is a long time ago. Um, yeah, and it's things just sort of escalated from there to the bizarre situation I'm in now. So I started YouTube because um, six years ago I was doing a uni degree. I was doing a degree in TV production, and just um, I was on summer break after my first year, and I thought, well. I need something to keep the skills going, so I just thought, and I, I'd done stuff on forums as well, um, just like tech stuff, didn't like reviews for like old games, because that's what I was interested in. Um, so I did a review of a Space Harrier 2 on the Mega Drive, and that was kind of my first one. And the um, first couple like, got about 10 views or whatever, but then um, gradually kind of started going, I think kind of one of my big like, early breakthroughs, I did a, a huge A to Z series on licensed video games. And I actually managed to see the whole project, I mean just like games, um, weird like movie tie-ins, like advert games, like what were some of the strangest ones? Um, things like, I don't know, um, <laughs> Chase the Chuck Wagon, which is an American uh, Atari game, which um, is a tie-in for a dog food company. Purina. Purina, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, I'm sure that sounds really enticing to everyone. Like, why wouldn't you play a game based on dog food? <laughs> but um, all sorts of like, interesting games, and that was kind of um, one of the first series that really started giving me a lot of attention, and I gradually moved from there to actually doing like, proper documentaries on companies like Ocean Software, uh, Cygnosis, um, the Commodore Amiga, and um, people like Clive Sinclair, Jack Tramiel. Um, it just kind of gradually evolved from there over like the six years I've been doing it. Obviously, I, I got quite into the YouTube, you know, video game videos. Uh, obviously, I watched all the very, very obvious American YouTubers, you angry video game nerds, all that sort of stuff. But 
I, I started to really focus in on, on, on channels that were doing a little bit more obscure stuff that I didn't know about that were just really interesting stories. It started with Angry Video Game Nerd when he did the Sword Quest videos because I just didn't know anything about Sword Quest. And that whole story about how you could win the chalice and the sword, I thought that was just so interesting. And that was one of the big influence, influences for me. Um, Lazy Game Reviews did a, uh, a video all about uh, DRM and calculators, and that sounds so incredibly boring, but the way he presented it was just, it blew my mind. I was watching Guru Larry for a really long time. I think it was your uh, Thundercats video was one that really pushed yeah. me finally over the edge. No, I am going to make my own channel, because I kept talking about it, because I knew a few stories that no one else seemed to be talking about. And um, if you, I don't know if you can do this, but if you if somehow look back at when I started my channel to when I uploaded my first video, it was like a year or maybe two years break because I just kept repeating the same video at home trying to redo it in different ways I was trying to be very American and be silly voice and I was going to be talking like this all the way through my video it was stupid um, and bling I, bling so, yeah bling bling <laughs> bum fight fans no it's um <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I kept redoing it, redoing it, and then I started seeing people like Lazy Game Reviews had finally done the Amstrad video that I wanted to do. I went, no, I'm not going to hang around anymore, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it professionally-ish. And I did the Roland, um, the, the, the story of Roland, that one we were talking about earlier. And um, I didn't know how to promote back then, now, you know, most people don't when they start YouTube channels, and I ran over to the Retro Gamer forums, as in the, the magazine Retro Gamer, and there was a section just for video submissions, and there was the proper one where you're not supposed to put your stuff, and I did put it in there, and I sit in there, and there was no response, no response, and I went to bed and I woke up the next day and there was a couple of pages of people just saying, that was an incredible video, well done, well done, and it just gave me the boost to constantly, constantly find new YouTubers, people like Kim and Nostalgia Nerd, obviously Did You Know Gaming, I was probably already watching that if I'm honest, but um, uh, just constantly pushing me to try and find more and more uh, subjects that are a little bit obscure that no one had ever covered, and I just went crazy with it. Uh, so yeah, the, the video that blew me up was actually the very first video I put out, and it just gave me so much drive. Uh, I think we started our YouTube channel about 10 years ago. I really don't remember because it's been so bloody long. Um, but for us, we, we sort of started by posting images on Facebook and Twitter and all this sort of stuff where it's just like, did you know gaming, picture of something, and then a little tidbit of trivia. And uh, they, that blew up super quick. It had like 300,000 uh, followers on Facebook or something when we did our first video. And uh, I, I just enjoy random tidbits of trivia. I like talking crap, really. So we thought, well, we can actually talk the crap in a video. Uh, and then we did that. Yeah, and, and get paid for it. Although, sadly, uh, it doesn't seem to work quite like that very much anymore. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I think our, our big video that blew us up was just the first one, because we already had a following. It, it had a million views in like a week, which was absolutely ludicrous. And I think it was on Pokemon or something boring and basic like that. But yeah, it's, it's pretty easy going, really. Just make videos and talk about video games. Uh, so I was made redundant in about 2011, and so I decided to set my own web development company up, which I did from home. And obviously, being at home running a company, it's quite uh, lonely and a bit boring. So to, to kind of pad my time out, I would go on to eBay and buy retro things, and then watch YouTube as well. And I started watching LGR quite a lot, and I would watch that while I was making websites. And slowly this pile of retro equipment would build up on one side, and I was watching LGR over here, and I was thinking, wait a minute, I can, I can do something here. Um, so I started making videos about the stuff I was buying, and, and then I cleared out my parents' house of all my old stuff and brought back old memories of the stuff I used to use. And one of, one of the early videos I had was about I found a box in my parents' attic which said, do not open until the year 2000. And I, was, <laughs> I was like, well, it's, it's, two, it's 2012 now, I, I, I can open this. So I, I videoed it, and um, the, the video is awful. I mean, you watch it back now, I think, what, what the hell were you thinking? I'm just babbling about some nonsensical rubbish. But I opened it thinking it was some sort of uh, kind of uh, box I'd made, so, what we call time capsule, and it was just some... Um, crappy plastic skeleton from a monthly magazine that I'd bunged in there and gone, get that crap out of the way, and chucked it in my parents' parents' loft. But um, that video seemed to do very well. It's got like two million views, and I, I still shudder when I see it. So I leave it up for the views, but 
it still is an amazing place. It is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in part, it's, 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 quite, it's quite creepy. It's, got, it's, it's, like a, it's, it's, it's like a it's like a woman who's got a little pregnant baby inside it, which has all been painted terribly by my seven-year-old hands. It looks like something out of a horror film. So it was quite shocking to see, and from, from there I thought I'd better up my game and start making better and better videos, which thankfully they are a bit better now than they used to be. Yeah. Well, years and years ago, in about 2005, my friend Wes and I, we presented a, a live phone-in cheat show uh, on Sky, where people ring up and ask for cheats. Do you remember cheats in video games? Hey, hey, those were the days. Anyhow, uh, we lost our jobs there because they thought uh, uh, Psychic Interactive was more profitable. You know, giving, giving false hope to the bereaved is much more profitable than cheese. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm never getting a job back there again. Anyhow, <laughs> anyhow yeah, no, we, uh, so Wes and I was trying to do some ideas of trying to make a uh, new business now. And we come up, this is 2005, we had this wonderful idea of being able to watch video game reviews on a mobile phone. I mean, this is like one of the old clamshell phones, you know, it's, it just doesn't happen. We, we had loads of meetings, like speaking to game and that. And, uh, and it just didn't pan out in the end, so we put them on this new thing called YouTube, and uh, they didn't take off, but uh, a website called Screw Attack um, saw them and decided to pick us up for that. So we were there for a few years, and then we went off on our own. Oh, we don't want that guy on the glasses, but yeah, the less of that, the better. <laughs> Shout out to Screw Attack, by the way. Those guys back in the day, they, they were amazing, right? Yeah, yeah, all the knives in the back, yeah, lovely. <laughs> Yeah. Right, we have got a few minutes if uh, you guys have got any questions for any of our panel. Just raise your hands, Ravi will run over with the mic. Hi, uh, I've got a question for Larry. Hello, you. Hi. I <laughs> um, just wanted to add quickly, uh, congratulations on being the new king of Channel Awesome. Oh, you, thank uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> you earned it, buddy. It was a well hard done. fight. It was a hard applause. fight, but I just soon got rid of him. <laughs> yeah. um, so, can you talk more about your time working on um, uh, doing retro games and modern games on um, television years ago, like yeah. X League and uh, Gamesville? Well, okay, maybe not Gamesville, but... Uh, yeah, come, just, come, uh, come give me some credit. Please. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, what, what was it like um, working on on those shows back then with um, Sky One and the other stuff? Well, it was things? exciting. I mean, if you didn't, if you long as you didn't mind not getting any money out of it, it was quite exciting. But uh, I think the best thing was just receiving free games. But we were so small right there. All we got was shovelware, and uh, basically that was the best, most fun thing we did was reviewing shovelware because it's so terrible. We just sit there making fun of it. Really, that's when we got the proper good games, when it went downhill a little bit. But it was very exciting. I mean, it's just, being on television was just like the YouTube back then. It was like the, we caught the tail end of when gaming television was relevant, really. <laughs> so yeah, but no, no, it's fun. It's lots of fun. I mean, I'd definitely do it again. We've got another question here. Hello there. Um, I do actually have a YouTube channel, but it's full of rubbish car boot sale uh, videos at the moment. But I'm considering, especially I've been watching a lot of uh, Slope and Larry. You, or actually, all of you there are quite inspirations to me. I'm thinking about doing a video of um, the UK history of Pokemon because it's quite an interesting history. But I'm just. Okay. Yes, um, stuff like. Um, the whole SMTV live, pretty much it helped Anton Deck's career, <laughs> essentially. And nobody really talks about it, shockingly. I've seen like videos talk about like the Canadian impact, the American, mm. the Japan's impact, but nobody's ever done United Kingdom. Yeah, we never get you, much yeah, you never, over here, it's, no. it's so, There's so many interesting stories, but back to my point. Um, what would guys would you recommend using for editing? <laughs> oh, we a actually computer. use two <laughs> program. A computer. I mean, you can use one of those old-fashioned city reels. Program, right? So. We use two different programs, don't we? I use Sony yeah. Vegas, and what do you use? I use um, Video Studio, which is basically like the Fisher Price of editing. I'm just really lazy and stubborn not to learn Vegas, really. <laughs> I mean, professionally, you should look at Vegas. It's a or, little or even steep. Premiere. That's what you use, isn't it? Premiere. Yeah. yeah. Um, Premiere or Vegas, really, as professional. You say you say it's like a, a Pokemon story that hasn't been told. Is that what you? Oh, yeah, it picks his interest now, you go steal it off him. Well, no, I'm Thief. just saying, if you, if you do spend the time on it and make it look good, that's the sort of video that would blow up. I mean, it's yeah. about Pokemon and people yeah. don't know it. Yeah, that, uh, that's I'm, a video that will blow up and if you tell me it, I'm going to make yeah, that video. Yeah, I, I would say you. try and write the script like a story as well, like a beginning, a middle and an end as well, because that really works well for that sort of narrative. Yeah. So try and write it like a story. Cool, just got one here. 
Hey guys, um, great to hear some love for the BBC with some of its great unlicensed uh, clones, uh, Doctor E, Zaliga, practically arcade perfect. Uh, but it's good to see that the BBC recently have done their history of the uh, uh, computer literacy pro project. And they've done a really good job of that with that website. Do you think there still is a, um, a place for the traditional media, as it were, talking about the history of video games? Or is it something that YouTube can actually do much better um, because of people that sort of loved it and broadcast I, to an audience that maybe appreciate it more than the, what, the mainstream? I think... Um the thing that's interesting about British video game industry and everything else is that we were kind of pioneers within the whole thing. So when it comes to people like the BBC, when you think about it, the BBC Micro was a real big deal. It, it taught a lot of people in schools how to code. We now have the Raspberry Pi project, which allows more children to get into coding. Um, and so I, I do think that there is place on TV to talk about it. I think it's surprising that the BBC kind of look at it negatively every now and then. Uh, considering they pioneered the whole bloody thing over here. Uh, okay. But, yeah, I think TV could present it in a good way. It has to be very British history, though. Uh, the problem with the video game industry is that everything that happens internationally does affect what happens here, whereas back in the day it was very different. We had our own sort of segregated video game industry. Um, where we have the internet now, it has to be very much everything, not just one country. So, for TV, I think, yeah, definitely. I, th I think it gets to a very different audience as well. I think you still have a different audience which will watch TV, people who aren't quite interested enough to search stuff up on YouTube, and then will get into that subject. So, I think there's a big scope of that. And t TV now seems to be taking the lead of that sort of uh, niche from, from, from us, from YouTubers. And you, you, it, there's, there's more programs and documentaries appearing, like... Um, Mm. On BBC Four, there's stuff like the history of Nokia and stuff like that, which you know it would fit well on a lot of our channels. And it, it seems to be they're, they're catching on to that. And I, I think it'll it'll come back in in due course and hopefully, be quite large. Yes. And hopefully, yes, because that was the trouble with TV and video games in the past. Well, the trouble with making TV in general is you have a lot of people who work in a program and it can really like pull in different directions so an original idea ends up being nothing like what actually comes out on the screen. But I mean as TV is kind of becoming well more and more niche in and of itself, yeah, perhaps like more documentaries like that will come up for video games as sort of like the odd one every few years. Hey yeah, uh, I've got a question for Sarah. Um, you've been very clear that Octavius is a character and not yourself and even shown yourself and the character in the same videos but what's it like kind of managing that expectation of your viewers where they start thinking you are Octavius? Sorry, where are you? Yeah. Oh, hi! Sorry, that was very bizarre. It was sort of like this... I'm, know, I'm sort of... <laughs> um, thank you for your question. Um, it's... It, it is a little bit difficult. I think um, I think everyone probably um, experiences this. The person that you are in front of a camera is always going to be very different to who you are, really are in real life. But um, you, you do always get people who assume it. And initially, I used to get really upset about it and think, oh, these people think that I really am utterly insane and um, a, a little bit too ostentatious and breasty, I suppose. Um, but. <laughs> Now I realise that there's not really much point in explaining to those people that it's a different thing because they're never going to understand it and when they do they tend to get annoyed anyway so I just, I, I kind of leave it now um, but it, at, at first it is, it is difficult to handle, I think probably everyone on this panel has experienced that um, especially given that I have quite serious anxiety and depression issues um, in person I think there has been a couple of occasions where people have met me and been very surprised to find that I quite frequently have panic attacks while talking to people um, and it's it, it is it's kind of hard to prepare people for that um, but I think if you kind of if I focused on that too much then I wouldn't be where I was now so um, yeah I, I, don't, I don't think I answered your question at all but it, thank you for the question anyway <laughs> we've got one last question here these guys are going to be available over there for signing afterwards so if you have any more questions uh, well, it's a quick follow-up for question for Larry, although I genuinely love all seven of your channels. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I'm just, I just wondering, have, you, have Channel Awesome reached out to you at all? Uh, they told me, uh, don't bother booking videos anymore, they're going to put them up automatically. But I've, not heard, I've heard one thing from Mike Michaud's brother, and that was that. So they've not really spoken anything to me. Uh, I think Doug
Doug, actually Doug wrote to me once, he was a bit upset about people turning on him, but he, people he considered friends. So he said thank you for sticking with me, but I was only there just, I'm trying to get myself fired to be honest. I just, I thought I'd be as much big as dick as possible, because I just thought I was the, if I was the only one there and the last person to be fired, I thought it'd be funny, really. But no, no, he's he very supportive of me, and you know, I don't see the point of leaving really, because there's no benefit in staying or going really, so a couple of extra views, really. <laughs> I'm that pathetic. So. Well, we have run out of time. That hour went really quickly. We could have like done about three more hours, I think, with you lot. But um, of course, our YouTubers will be available for our photos signing. If you want to ask any more questions, they'll be available for a while after the panel. We need to get off this stage because Nightmare Live is going to be setting up in here very soon. You remember Nightmare back in the day? You've got to give that a try today. And if you've enjoyed this panel, there will be more downstairs on the Retro Hour talk stage. We've got Andrew Hewson uh, giving a history of Hewson Consultants. And then we're actually going to have a Nightmare panel down there at half past three this afternoon and you can get more panels like this every week on our podcast at